Thanks, Montana, and happy learning. Good evening and welcome back to our continuing special series here on Montana PBS. I'm John Twig. Well, this is the first week for Governor Steve Bullock's phase one gradual reopening of the state and there are mixed feelings as there are plenty of questions as we loosen restrictions for the first time in about a month. And we've got a great panel and special guests to provide information and to answer your questions. In just a minute, our first interview guest will be Governor Steve Bullock. as He will join us to talk about the reopening plan and ramping up testing as well. Then later in the show, we've got an outstanding panel to, again, provide more information and answer your questions. The head of the governor's coronavirus task force, Major General Matthew Quinn will answer questions about the reopening plan. State Medical Officer, Dr. Greg Holzman will assist with more medical questions. And there's new research out about Montana's economy and forecast. And Pat Barkey will be back with us to discuss that again in more depth. Of course, the important part of the equation is you. We want to hear from you tonight with your questions, a variety of ways you can get in touch with us. You can call us on the toll-free number at the bottom of the screen. If you prefer to type out that question, you can send us an email also at the address on the bottom of the screen, or you can find us on Facebook. We look forward to hearing from you tonight. Now, first, here's a recap of the recent information. And as we can see, Montana continues to trend in the right direction. These are the number of positive cases you can see in that graph form in the last few weeks. A downward trajectory provides encouraging data for Montanans. As for the county map, these are the cumulative totals, and you can see that 25 counties still without a confirmed case, Gallatin County still with the most at 146. Very telling when you look at the active cases right now of COVID-19 in Montana, Gallatin County with none out of 146, 40 counties without an active case right now, and that's actually Tool County that has the most uh, current cases of COVID-19 in the state of Montana. Now, yesterday, Governor Bullock announced uh, an ambitious plan to increase testing in Montana, setting a big goal there of 60,000 tests per month. That's almost 10 times the rate of what we're doing right now. Also targeted some vulnerable populations that they wanted to give attention to, along with uh, willing residents of nursing homes and assisted living. They also wanted to do some sentinel testing for Native American communities to see if there are any patterns developing there. Now to talk more in depth, about this expanded testing program. We go right to the top as we're going to talk with Governor Steve Bullock. Governor Bullock joining us tonight from his home in Helena. Governor, thank you so much for being with us. We know it's still an extremely busy time, so we'll just jump right into it to talk about the testing. And you know, before there were at least a couple of deterrents to expanding the testing, and that was cost and logistics. So first, let's talk about logistics. What has changed? Is there a better supply chain, uh, better sources? This is a big step you're taking here for Montana. much is that you know we have uh, among actually the lowest per capita of hospitalizations and positive tests in the country now as we start a gradual reopening they'll really do want to make sure that we have a testing capacity in place i mean the challenges all throughout this have really been to make sure that we could get both the testing kits the swabs the supplies and reagents and uh, you know i wouldn't uh, be exaggerating if I said that over the last 45, 50 days, that's been almost an everyday endeavor. But I think that we are getting both to the point where we're getting sufficient supplies that make me confident being able to do this. And the federal government is working more as a partner now in helping us obtain those supplies. Well, the other hurdle, of course, was cost. Well, the other hurdle, of course, was cost. Where, where would that money come from? Where, where? Yeah, so first of all, as we look at this overall testing plan, you have both under Medicaid and under um, private insurance and under Medicare that all the costs of COVID-19, the actual tests are being covered. And from that perspective, that's not the biggest concern. Then we also have five strike teams that are gonna be made up of National Guard members and a registered nurse to provide some of the assistance along the way. That we can cover with federal emergency dollars. and. When we talk about like the challenges of both Montanans struggling and having concerns and our economy, from my perspective, the more expansive testing that we can have, not only will that give us a better sense of what this virus is doing as we do a phased reopening of our economy, but it'll also give people more confidence 
as they get out and start going, you know, to some of our retail stores and other places. And Governor, again, just and to Governor, again, clarify, will, will there be out-of-pocket costs for Montanans? They say they want to get tested, they want to go in. Uh, are there any costs there? No, no costs, no out-of-pocket costs for individuals who want to get tested. And from a sort of com community and statewide perspective, that's sort of the phase one of this is anyone with even one of the symptoms of COVID-19, and that list has been expanded, certainly encourage you to go get tested. Certainly quarantine until you get those results, but get tested both for your own peace of mind and to make sure that you don't become part of spreading in our communities. Now, another issue that now, came another up issue that came the last uh, couple of weeks, of course, is the inconsistency of, of county to county in terms of reporting and, and the number of tests and the data that's being reported and how it's being reported. Is, is that going to be addressed as, as we go forward? Because that seems like that's a critical component to getting that clear picture of what's going on in Montana. Yeah, and John, one of the challenges with just looking county by county is what you're doing also is looking at where the actual individual goes to get the test versus where they even live. So it's sort of provider by provider. But the way that we've set this up is, yeah, first of all, everybody in Montana ought to be getting tested, certainly if they have any symptoms. We want to, the most vulnerable populations, not only in Montana, but across the country are in our nursing homes, our assisted living facilities. So over the next couple of weeks, we'll be testing literally everyone and the providers in those. Surveillance testing then is trying to get a better sense, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, of what might be happening on the ground, which helps inform us all the way along. So starting with our tribal nations, but at the end of this, where we want to be able to get is also through our community health centers in big towns and small all across the state to get more surveillance testing. So we have a real good sense of what's happening. And you had said earlier that there's not necessarily a timeline attached to trying to reach that goal of, of tests per month. So let's look at this from a different angle. What kind of factor will it be in terms of moving from, let's say, phase one to phase two, phase two to phase three? Do you, do you just want to see progress? Do you want to see us get halfway to that goal? How, how will that factor into the decision? Sure. And first of all, you know, as I say, look, there's not a timeline to get to 60,000. Like I'm pushing the team that you'll be hearing saying, I will want to see 15,000 a week because I think that that will not only give us a better sense, but the modicum of comfort. Now we're ramping up and it all starts on Monday. So we'll go from there to really get to that level or higher as we go into the summer. When it comes to phase one to phase two as an example, what we really need to do is see how both Montana our friends and neighbors are responding and how this virus is responding to get to that next phase. What gave me the confidence to even open up, Montana is one of the few states in the country that actually should be having this discussion of opening up. I could look at our virus levels dropping as far as the COVID-19 positives in conjunction with not seeing an increase in hospitalizations for an extended period of time. I knew that we had the supplies necessary. So when I look at going from phase one to phase two, um, it's impossible to put a timeline because in some respects, what we're talking about today is actually looking anywhere from a week to two weeks backwards, meaning that today's positive transmission didn't happen necessarily just today. So I wanna see what's happening with additional spread, making sure that we're taking the right steps to both isolate and do the contact tracing along the way. And if we continue to suppress and contain uh, COVID-19 in Montana across the state, then we'll be looking at phase two. But that won't, can't even really have that discussion with public health folks for at least a couple of weeks. And Governor, uh, before we let you go, Governor, one of the before we let you go, area one of that was of concern to a lot of viewers, and that was the, a lot the state of budget. We've been talking a lot about uh, how much things cost, and of course, there's been a lot of talk about the federal budget and that deficit. But let's focus on Montana's state budget. Do you think Montana will need federal help and and making up for that massive amount of lost revenue. Yeah, and Jen, you know, I'm on calls every single uh, week with both all the Democratic and Republican governors. And often the president joins us, the vice president has joined us. And that has been a uniform discussion of at the end of the day, when we're looking at where the federal government ought to be going, to make sure that our states and our local governments have resources. I think to the extent that there's another sort of 
national bill, we'll probably see that. In Montana, though, think about it, like we left $300 million in the bank uh, during the leg legislative session, another $100 million in the budget stabilization reserve. We have $70 million in our fire fund. So the state budget, just like everybody's, you know, everybody's personal budgets and local government's budget has certainly been hit hard, but I have more confidence because of what we did in keeping a little bit of money in the bank than I would if I was staying near any other governor of the country. Well, Governor Bullock, I want to once again thank you for spending time with us this evening and sharing this information. It's uh, good to know and good to hear for our citizens across the state of Montana. So thanks once again for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, John. Thanks for the good work that you and PBS are doing. That's Governor Steve Bullock, uh, again, talking about the expanded testing program that is on the way here in the uh, state of Montana as they work towards gradually reopening the state. And that's one element of it. Another element of uh, gradually reopening the state are businesses and what they're adjusting to. And that's really not a simple process. Montana PBS's Jackie Coffin traveled to parts of Montana to see how businesses are navigating in this new world. With an approach of slow and steady wins the race, Governor Bullock is opening up Montana businesses and places of worship after six weeks of shuttered doors and social distancing. In so many ways, we have stood together in the face of this crisis. We've done it the Montana way, by taking care of our neighbors when things get tough. These collective actions have allowed us to get to where we are today. And that's to begin a phased reopening of the state. The phased plan of reopening shifts a lot of responsibility to individual counties, school boards, business owners, and citizens to make decisions of what to open up and ensure the rules of social distancing and safe practices will be followed. And as we start to take actions to relax some of the directives, it becomes a responsibility of our businesses to take measures to better protect their employees as well as their customers. At Paradise Falls in Missoula, co-owned by father-daughter duo Stacy Nugent and Tom McLaughlin, they are busy preparing for reopening. The rules and regulations are um, still changing a little bit, um, especially because the um, city and county health department have control over that, um, even beyond what the governor's recommendations have been. Um, and so with them being completely bombarded and um, taking over a lot more um, business responsibility than, than they're used to. Um, the timing hasn't been great in our favor, but we're so appreciative of, of the communication we've had so far. For restaurants, phase one of reopening includes 50% of customer capacity, groups no larger than six, no bar seating or standing, and a long list of procedures for disinfecting and cleaning everything. We have had to cut our occupancy in half um, and ensure that there is a six foot radius basically from every chair to the next um, group. So that's been a challenge. Um, our staff will bring back with uh, facial coverings um, to try and protect them as best we can. and see how it goes. The Missoula County Health Department strengthened the governor's orders of reopening and is not at this time allowing some establishments like hair salons to reopen. But in the Flathead, they opened up shop on Monday. Um, Susie Susie is a salon, it's a full service salon. There's such a wide opinion of what's going on and it's really hard to be able to be in the middle of it. While Susie Susie is reopened and taking clients, owner Liberty Barkley respectfully asked me not to come inside, as one condition of salons and barbershops reopening is a very limited number of people inside at a time. She wants to show she is closely following the governor's orders. We are open for those that feel comfortable coming in, but we also want to make sure that they know that we are being very serious and take the virus serious, but being also able to take care of um, the services for the clients. So um, using masks, we ask the client to wear a mask as well. We have been asking them that when they park in the parking lot to give our front desk a call. And then what we do is as soon as we're done cleansing our station, having our other client all checked out, we then will go ahead and call them and have them meet us at the front door. 
Salons and retail stores were given a green light to reopen this last Monday, but the first organizations allowed to open their doors were churches and other houses of worship. Still, many didn't. Driving around on Sunday, parking lots were empty and church bells were silent. Daniel Veland is a Methodist minister in Townsend and East Helena. Methodist churches are planning to open on June 1st. I was looking at those guidelines, you know, it says you, know, you can meet if you have follow, if you're able to follow strict social distancing. Um, we probably could have figured out a way to do that. I mean, we do have room in our sanctuary uh, in both churches to do that. Um, but I think to be really confident that we're doing it well would have been a really difficult process. Uh, and the other really big reason is that we have a significant number of people in both of my churches who are part of that vulnerable, uh, who, who, who fit that kind of that vulnerable category. The folks who are still supposed to be staying at home. In the last couple of weeks, viewers have asked if it is safe to take communion. Pastor Veland says this. I've, I've read a lot about this. Um, and as far as from everything I've read, there's never been a documented case of someone getting sick from from receiving communion. There is no set timeline on when we move forward from phase one to phase two. And Governor Bullock says that depends on how we do as a Montana community on maintaining social distancing and following the rules. I'm Jackie Coffin reporting for Montana PBS. And of course, next week, more businesses will be opening and uh, there will be uh, more issues to deal with as we move forward in this gradual re reopening. Let's bring in our panel for this evening. We have a great group for you that uh, are ready to answer your questions and provide us with more information. We're excited to have Major General Matthew Quinn with us, along with our state medical officer, Dr. Greg Holzman and Pat Barkey joining us uh, from Missoula tonight as well. And so we're going to dive right into the questions. And uh, Major General Quinn, let's let's start with you about the reopening uh, and actually about expanding the testing. We were talking with the governor about that, and of course that didn't just happen overnight. We know that was a process and uh, brought in a lot of different partners. I wondered if you could give us some insight into what was involved as you talked with different people, maybe on the federal level, the state level. Uh, what were some of the voices you were listening to as far as uh, trying to make this big decision and take this big step forward? Yeah, thanks, John, uh, and good evening. So it, it was a long process for 45 days. You know, we've been watching the trends in Montana and Governor Bullock assembled a team together and I had the honor to uh, to lead that. But as we started to see the uh, trends coming down and Montana looking pretty good, we started to ask the question about reopening and, and what does reopening look like uh, and what would, uh, what would it take? So we brought together kind of five focus areas that we wanted to bring together and then people from across Montana uh, out of the education uh, sector, Main Street Montana sector, restaurants, uh, bars, healthcare, and then also tourism. Because it wasn't going to be a state level decision, it needed to be a local level decision. And so we had, uh, we had restaurant owners, bar owners, we had educators, uh, school superintendents. Uh, but overarching all of that, was an excellent team of health professionals, both from the state level and then from the local health level, because to guide this decision that Governor Bullock was gonna make to guide the state forward through a reopening, a phased reopening approach, we needed those health professionals to look at the plan, look at what the recommendation was gonna be, give us what those trigger points should be as we looked at different phases of reopening and, um, what considerations each, each of those sectors should take in order to continue to protect Montanans and continue on the path that we were on for COVID-19. Major General Quinn, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Holzman, uh, that, that, that's you as far as the healthcare professionals there. And uh, in the previous directives uh, that we've been talking about, shelter in place, they're usually been in, in two week increments and maybe even an extension of a two week increment. We've been thinking that way, at least a lot of us across the state have. Is that long enough now to get a picture of the virus activity in Montana? I know people are always anxious to go from phase one to phase two, uh, or do we need to readjust our thinking on that? Well, I, I think the governor stated it very well. Um, we're looking at what happened in the past and trying to make some decisions uh, from that. So basically, if you think about if somebody was to get the virus today, they might not show symptoms up to 14 days. Most of them are between four and seven days. 
Then they decide to, that they go to the, the physician or their healthcare provider get tested. We get a positive test back from the lab. You could be nine days out from when they actually first got the virus uh, and where some of the spreading might have happened. So um, thinking it through all that way, I think two weeks is probably at the minimum that we would really want to, to look at. And we will probably be looking a little bit further out. However, at this point in time, we have staggered things a little bit. So, you know, we've had our first openings that happened this week, and next week we'll have be adding a little bit more. And we're going to continue to monitor this really, really closely. Um, so that's all looks really, really good. And I think probably the most positive thing that's looked on it is we continue to see the numbers go down. Today was another zero day on um, all our testing came back, no positive. So um, that's always a, a good thing to see. Yes, good news, Dr. Holzman. And uh, we look forward to more of that. We're gonna shift it over to the economy, Pat. And your organization released a new study on Montana's economy and the forecast uh, related to COVID-19 uh, this week. And also this week, uh, another 15,000 Montanans uh, filing for unemployment. Um, so let's start with that, the, the job loss forecast. And uh, we're going to have a graphic from your uh, presentation there, Pat. And if you can explain the different regions and the numbers behind them as we look at this. Sure. We, uh, we jumped into what is a fluid and fast moving situation to try to uh, give decision makers and leaders some information uh, in terms of order of magnitude where we are in terms of our state economy. Because quite frankly, unlike uh, infections or the stock market or some other pieces of, uh, of, of the environment we all live in, it takes a while for really solid economic information to arrive. So we uh, jumped in and made a projection of the state economy as of April. And uh, that's based on what we know. Uh, and that projection showed that the state economy is, is in a recession which is a very broad-based recession, a very fast-moving recession that is more severe than anything we have encountered in post-war history. The graphic is there to give you an idea of the order of magnitude of the job loss we expect to see in the different regions of the state. The main message of this graph is that uh, no part of the state is going to be exempt from the pain of this, of this downturn. Uh, these job numbers reflect annual averages. So over the course of 2020, where we had some growth in the beginning, we expect to see some growth at the end of this year with the middle part being pretty doggone bad. So you put that together and you get some of these statistics. Northwestern uh, part of the state is expected to have the largest job losses. Uh, that also happens to be the most populous part of the economy, but it, it reflects the industry mix of what happens in Western Montana, but it's uh, there's some good news in our report. I'll, I hope to get to it, but uh, this certainly is the uh, is is the tough message that we're all learning and and uh, we're sharing with the folks that have to make decisions. Well, we'll we'll definitely get to some good news, Pat. We'll we'll make make that a priority here before we get through the uh, end of the show. So. Uh, great to hear from everybody on the panel. I want to remind our viewers that uh, they're standing by now to take your questions. We'd love to hear from you, either a phone call or shoot us an email or find us on Facebook. Uh, uh, we'd love to have you participate in our interactive program here tonight. So we'll continue on uh, with uh, Major General Quinn. And uh, this is one that uh, Beth has emailed in for us, uh, Major General, and it's about how how to ensure that when tourist season hits and we have that huge influx of tourists that the, the state can enforce the 14 day quarantine. And I know you think the word enforce might be a little bit harsh there, but um, I think there are some concerns from, from people watching and thinking about this, about how, how that works and, and what your vision is for that. So governor has done a couple of things on this, uh, on this front. One, we do have national guard members at the airports and train stations across Montana. Uh, as well as the uh, the FBOs where private planes will come into uh, doing temperature checks. That's, you know, some baseline screening, asking questions about where they've been and then reminding those who are traveling in from out of state of the 14 day uh, quarantine period uh, required for, for those who are coming in, not for work purposes, but for, uh, for other purposes. So uh, that's at the, uh, the train and the airport. We also have uh, reader boards on the major interstates coming into Montana, reminding in individuals of the 14-day quarantine, if, again, if they're coming in for non-work purposes. 
certainly the other thing I would say is uh, for Montanans to remind uh, others that they see that that may be uh, visiting, uh, others who are coming in that they know of that are that are visiting non-work related, to remind them of the 14-day quarantine. We understand because we're hearing from across Montana that Montanans are concerned. Uh, tourism industry is big for Montana, and so those two um, are out there, but we know that in order to continue to control the spread, we're gonna have to try to limit that social contact that we've done so well at here in Montana. And that includes ensuring that individuals come to visit, coming to visit Montana, do a 14 day period of quarantine to ensure that they're not bringing coronavirus into Montana. It is indeed a, a team effort. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we move on to the medical end of it. And uh, Dr. Holzman, uh, we have another viewer question coming in and this talks about a little bit more specific with testing. We didn't really get to talk to the governor too much about this because we use that broad term of testing, but they also wanted to know if testing for antibodies was part of this or is this strictly a diagnostic test? You can talk a little bit more about that as we refer to expanding the testing here in Montana. Yeah, thank you, John. That's a great question. Um, what we're talking about doing right now in the surveillance is actually using what we call the PCR testing, which is uh, testing if the person actually has the virus right at that time. So it's a, a moment in time testing. The antibody testing, which is getting a lot of press these days, is something that I think all of us are very excited about and see the use of it as being another tool in our toolbox when it's out and ready to go. So far of the ones that are out there, there's still quite a bit of uh, questions on the reliability of the test. So you can kind of get false positives um, because the test might not be specific enough to coronavirus or this coronavirus, the coronavirus 19, it might pick up some other coronavirus. And so we get mixed messages on that. The other issue that I think we're still learning about is do you get immunity and how long do you get immunity if you've had this virus or have antibodies to this? And this is all things that um, we're con continuously, continuously learning. I think one of the things that I just got to keep reminding myself is, you know, it was in December that we first learned about this virus, really since uh, late February that we've started to see it quite active in this country. Um, and it's amazing how much we know already about this virus, but there's still a lot we don't know and, and we're learning more and more every day. Thank you, Dr. Holzman. Uh, we've shifted back to the economy once again, Pat, and uh, we have some questions about uh, a couple of different specific sectors of the economy and in particular, uh, energy and agriculture. And I know those were a couple that were hard hit uh, before the pandemic really uh, with some volatile markets that, that uh, did not do them any favors. So for energy and agriculture, what is their forecast looking like? Well, energy is a mix because um, in, in normal times, that is to say when the price of oil is positive and not negative, um, you would you would see some, uh, some hope that uh, energy, particularly on the oil and the refining side would be a, a, would be a stable um, contributor to the economy. But of course, so this has all gotten mixed up in the, it began with the price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia, and now it's come into a, 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 a domestic supply storage uh, shortage, uh, where we've just seen crazy things happen to these crude oil prices and it's starting to extend into the future. So energy, uh, particularly on the oil side, uh, looking uh, quite bleak, uh, um, and, and that factors into state revenue because uh, we, uh, we, our extraction taxes, our value are related. And when the price goes down very low, the revenue from those uh, revenue sources goes down uh, immediately. Um, so energy is, is mostly getting hammered by markets. Ag agriculture is, uh, is, I would say, of the things that Montana ag producers worry about every day, COVID is down the list. I mean, it is certainly a concern. It's affecting markets. And there are some funny things obviously happening in a lot of ag markets, particularly when you look at the price uh, gaps that have opened up and the, and the trends that don't seem to be on the same page with respect to retail, wholesale and producer prices. But uh, I think ag producers are mostly worried about the weather. I think they're worried a lot about uh, planting. I think they're worried about 
harvest and, and they're worried about, uh, yes, they're worried about COVID, uh, but it's down the list. I think it's a, uh, it's a sector that we don't expect to see uh, bear the brunt of, uh, of the uh, downturn that's upon us right now, unlike some other industries, most notably tourism. Well, there is some good news in that. So thank you very much, Pat. Uh, we bring it back around to uh, Major General Quinn as uh, we continue on with our panel. And again, uh, we appreciate all the questions that are coming in tonight uh, from our viewers. Uh, you make it a, an important part of our program. So Major General Quinn, we, we, we wanted to ask about the task force and the idea of if you all were observing and looking at other states, as you were starting to work on this, and maybe were there are some good examples that you saw to follow, could have been a cautionary tale of you don't want to do that. What, were you all uh, having a chance to observe what was happening in other parts of the country? Yeah, a, a great question, John. We are. So um, part of this is, as Governor mentioned, there's, uh, there's weekly calls with the Vice President. President Trump oftentimes joins in. Our National Guard uh, across uh, the United States is on calls three times a week, talking about best practices across the state that the National Guard has seen. Almost all of those National Guard entities are embedded within the public health realm. And so those lessons learned um, help a, a lot. The governor's calls among the Council of Governors or National Governors Association, lessons are learned are coming out of there. Public health is talking across the nation with uh, with each other. This has really been, so you know, the saying is it's locally executed, state managed and federally uh, resourced. And that has been so true here. But I've never seen in terms of emergencies that we've handled in Montana before, typically forest fires, floods, snow, you know, typically they're isolated to Montana. This has been a nationwide effort where we're competing with resources with other states our first batch of masks that we got came from our friends to the east, North Dakota. Uh, they helped us out because they had a stockpile of masks that they could share. So lessons are, are uh, being shared across the nation, both as you point out, uh, lessons not to do, uh, don't do this, but also lessons of, hey, this has worked well. And so that has fed into our opening phases. It has fed into our testing protocols and and how we governor has talked about expanding the testing across Montana. Um, we need to use every resource that we can as we look at how best to serve Montanans. And this team has done that. Thank you, uh, Major General Quinn. Uh, we move on to a medical question for Dr. Holzman. And, and this is one that has come up uh, periodically, probably every other week now. And, and, uh, continues to be asked, a caller uh, watching tonight, calling in, wanted to know again, what the benefit is of wearing a mask. I think, uh, you know, we, we go to certain stores, you see it, other stores, you don't see it as much. And so there's a question about the benefit of wearing a mask. And also if this uh, person that wears rubber gloves, should they be putting hand sanitizer on it or washing the gloves as well? So a, a couple of practical questions there for you, Dr. Holzman. Sure, so yeah, that's a, a big question that comes about. And I, I guess I'd take a step back and say, one way of, as we're opening up Montana more and, and across the country, common thing that we'll say is it's on us. It's really on us of what we do now because we want to help our economy come back. We want to help starting to address all these other issues. We've suppressed the virus so well. Now it's a matter of trying to contain it and move forward with our new normal. And so the mask is one thing that I think about in the, in the overall concept of, um, almost act as if you have the virus and you're trying to prevent anybody else from getting spread from, from you. And so in that sense, but when you're wearing a cloth mask, what you're doing is protecting those around you. We, when we talk, we sometimes spit a little bit. Um, you can accidentally cough or sneeze. That's kind of holding things back and decreasing the risk that you're gonna transmit things to people around you. And so that's where the, the mask can be very, very helpful. Uh, of course, we have higher grade masks that we use in certain situations in the hospital and those taking care of individuals. So that that's aspect there too. As far as the gloves on your hands, um, I think it helps remind us uh, not to be touching your face and, and trying to be good about uh, those type of things. Um, if you put gloves on and then do everything else that you normally would do, um, 
the gloves will just get as dirty just as your hands will and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's important that you're washing your hands, you're limiting, trying to stop touching your face, especially your mouth, nose, and eyes, where you can uh, inoculate yourself with the virus if you happen to get it on your hands. Thank you, Dr. Holzman. Uh, always bears repeating, even no matter how many times we get to ask the question, it's important to keep going back over that. Uh, Pat, we kind of touched on this a little bit at the end of your last answer, but we're headed towards warm weather. And that means everybody's starting to think about tourism season here in Montana. So uh, let's dive into that. What is the forecast for the tourism industry? Well, it keeps changing, but uh, I'll tell you the immediate uh, decline in recreation, travel, uh, spending has been enormous. Uh, you know, particularly you look at air travel, uh, down 80, 85 percent. Uh, even the flight capacity uh, to and from Montana has been impacted, even if those planes were full, which they're not. Uh, I think we're looking at a pretty bleak picture uh, for tourism in Montana uh, this summer. Uh, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, a lot of forecasts I make, I hope I'm right. This time, I hope I'm wrong. Uh, the good news for Montana is that the, uh, the, the worst of the tourism impacts are likely to be in the beginning of the summer, uh, and they should be tapering off towards the end of the summer. Uh, that would appear to be good news for us in Montana. The problem is, though, is that the planning for those trips, as most people in that industry are fully aware, the planning for those trips takes place right at the time when the, the uncertainty is at its highest. So I think it's going to be harsh on Montana. We're a, we're a distant destination for many, many people. And the plans for making their, their lifetime dream trip of coming and seeing our spectacularly beautiful state are really are getting thrown a curveball. So it's a, you know, just to put some numbers on it, uh, you know, we're looking at 80% declines in tourism spending nationally in the beginning of the spring. Uh, that's, that's the good news is that's April, that's right now. Uh, but I think we're looking at double digit declines uh, for spending and uh, it's, uh, there's just no way to, uh, to fix that uh, from a policy point of view. It's, it's gonna be a, a massive speed bump, if not a canyon that uh, those in that business have to navigate. Those are harsh numbers, Pat, but we do appreciate uh, uh, the information and we're going to keep with a topic related to tourism and that's with the national parks closed. Montana's state parks are actually seeing a 60% increase in terms of visitation and Montana PBS's Brianna McCabe shows us how the state and its parks are preparing for visitors. Montanans don't need much of an excuse to get outside. I don't know if it's the pandemic or the nicer weather. Especially after the past month. Instead of just being at home and um, doing nothing. But I've been stuck inside for a long time. Yeah. So <laughs> after a month long stay at home directive due to COVID-19 spring fever has visitors hitting Montana State Parks at summertime levels. We're actually um, up over 60% um, in day use visitation, uh, which is fairly significant for this time of year, seeing that in a shoulder season like we're in right now, um, we're not necessarily staffed up for kind of summer level visitation like that. But it's great that people are coming out and finding a safe place to recreate. Meanwhile, the gates to our national parks remain closed to visitors. So park officials are spending this time strategizing how to handle crowds in what they still expect to be a busy summer season. Seeing the popularity of people, sort of that pent up energy that so many people have, we won't be short of visitors, I don't think. I thought maybe we could go a little further. Glacier and Yellowstone National Parks are working with health departments and businesses in their neighboring communities and following state and federal guidance on a timeline for reopening. They don't want to overwhelm local resources too soon, but they also don't want to deprive those same communities of the summer income they rely upon. What I've seen develop here, especially over the last week, is a, a fairly substantial shift from, okay, we, we kept the park closed, we did our due diligence, how do we safely uh, start having conversations about opening and getting these businesses back on their feet? I mean, there's a billion dollars, over a billion, spent by visitors within 60 miles of, of Yellowstone and Grand Tetons National Park last year. 
But before national parks open, they want to make sure they can keep both park staff and visitors safe. Like state parks, they're looking at how to safely open visitors' centers and keep up with bathroom sanitization. And that may happen in phases. They will have to make tough decisions about bringing back shuttle and tour buses like Glacier's popular Red Jammers. But once the gates are open, the parks may have limited control over how visitors behave at their outdoor attractions. You know, we have around 11,000 people per day on the boardwalk at Old Faithful on an average summer day. There's really no control point there. And so what I would hope would be that the general public will you know, do their best to adhere to the national, uh, state, and local health guidelines. But I've also said that the Park Service is not going to be the social distancing police, that we'll hope to partner with the public as we go through this to really um, take care of each other, understanding that their irresponsibility uh, can affect and infect others around them. Park officials hope visitors broaden their itineraries and expectations beyond the stereotypical Montana highlight reel. If there was one thing I could wish for our visitors, it would be that they think and realize that Glacier is just the tip of the iceberg, that there's this huge area called Montana that offers just a whole diversity of experiences. And that includes our state parks. You can see a bunch of cars but not see anyone for a long while, so... I feel pretty confident that we're safe out here in the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And Montana has long been known as a state where there's still plenty of space to keep some distance. For Montana PBS, I'm Brianna McCabe. Now, Montana State Park campgrounds are going to be open for uh, overnight camping. That's going to be on a first-come, first-served basis, and that's going to start tomorrow. And then in two weeks, online reservations kick in. So. All uh, good news for all of us that got a serious case of uh, cabin fever as we try and get out and about here in the state of Montana. Let's continue on with our panel this evening as we're getting more great questions from viewers all across the state. And uh, Major General Quinn, we've got one for you here. Uh, Bill in Bozeman is uh, writing in tonight wanting to know why, why there's a difference between those visiting for tourism versus those visiting for business. So if you're coming in for business, are you, how, how's that being handled? Are they being asked to quarantine or other restrictions? Just how that was differentiated by the task force? Yeah, that's a great question again, and one that we, uh, that we looked at pretty hard. And so those who are coming in for business um, and work-related purposes uh, are not being asked to quarantine because that work would probably need to commence about the time that they're coming in. We are asking businesses to look close at the employees I know a lot of the contractors that are operating in Montana, a lot of the businesses who are bringing in individuals from out of state are testing or not testing those individuals, but screening the individuals to make sure that they're healthy, they, they aren't having any symptoms of uh, COVID-19. If they have any symptoms, I think uh, we're hearing that they are quarantining those individuals until the symptoms subside. Again, those who are coming in for non-work related purposes though, we are asking because there's no urgency uh, to their trip. We are asking that they do the 14 day quarantine, self quarantine, and, um, and, and just again, to protect Montanans that are living and working here uh, so that we aren't getting COVID-19 brought into the state from outside. Major General Quinn, thank you for that. Uh, we shifted back over to the medical question for Dr. Holzman and uh, we have a viewer uh, calling in tonight, uh, Dr. Holzman, that they had heard that other states are ramping up efforts of contact tracing and that they're uh, hiring a large number of people to do this. And they wanted to know if Montana had any plans to build up a contact tracing workforce. Yeah, um, we're of course looking at that. One of the huge advantages that we have in Montana is we haven't had very many cases, especially lately. So our local public health has done an incredible job uh, to be able to do that contract tracing and do it very, very quickly. We do have um, surge capacity and we have that in place. Uh, the state can help out at the local level and actually even at the national level, they've started some um, even online programs to teach people how to do contract tracing and uh, we could bring some people on board that way. So there's a lot of things that are going on. Um, Right now we're doing great and I'm hoping that we're gonna contain this virus that we don't need to do any of the surge, but we're ready in case it does happen. 
Thank you, Dr. Holzman. Uh, we've got another question coming in, Pat, for the uh, economy. This one is uh, a call we got in from Whitehall over by Butte, and uh, they wanted to know if uh, consumer trends were suggesting that people might shop at big box stores or perhaps local businesses. And of course, they wanted to know if there was a way to encourage more local shopping moving forward. Uh, what, what trends have you been hearing about how that works? Well, uh, actually, the um the virus has accelerated the trend towards big box. I I I, I have to say, uh, simply because the uh, you know in, in the communities where that is a, as an option, uh, we've been going in that direction already. We've been going towards uh, more online uh, purchasing. That's that's a that's a trend that predates COVID by many many years, uh, and it's been uh, a question. Uh, questions have been posed to Montana shoppers that have not been posed to many of us for years. And that is, does my store have any pasta? Does my store have any, whatever the issue is? So uh, that continues to be a big challenge. Of course, we're a big and a very diverse state and those stores only exist in the larger urban areas. So it's hard to say that in a breath of air, but I think the uh, the issue with, uh, with shopping has been the, uh, the tremendous strain on off-premise food and, and beverage consumption placed by uh, the changes in behavior and also the stay-in-place uh, regulations. So we've seen this enormous swing towards uh, uh, Montanans and Americans for that matter, buying their food, eating their food at home, buying at the grocery store. It's put a big strain on a system that wasn't geared to work that way for many, many years. Thank you, Pat. Uh, we keep moving forward here with uh, Major General Quinn, and I, I think we had a viewer who uh, who saw your uniform here for this one because they said there are 60,000 tests a month. That is a lot, and they wanted to know, will the National Guard help administer a large quantity of those tests? Yeah, great question. So we have talked about the National Guard doing that. Uh, in most cases, it takes a medical professional. Uh, National Guard could help with the observation, could help with traffic control as we open up. But I'll tell you, um, Governor Bullock has talked to the community health centers across the state of Montana. Montana has a really good uh, network of community health centers that, that are engaged in this. They're willing to help with the, uh, with the testing. If there's an area of Montana that, um, that doesn't have that facility, doesn't have that resource, then certainly the governor has put National Guard on call in order to be able to go up and assist them. We would need a medical provider to, to go with us. Other states have done it, but it's been National Guard uh, in states that have a large contingency of medical providers. We've been a little cautious about that in the Montana National Guard, because as we pull in whatever medical providers we have, we're probably pulling those medical providers out of our local hospitals, local clinics, where there may be a need for those providers as well. And so I think our best resources, the community health centers, Indian health services that are out there. And if there's an area or a hotspot that National Guard needs to uh, mobilize to, we're willing and able to do that. And there is a list of individuals, medical providers, who will volunteer to be able to go out and assist the National Guard if that happens. So we stand ready uh, and able to do that. But again, uh, this network of community health centers and Indian health services across Montana is just a terrific network that we can rely on. Thank you, Major General Quinn. Uh, yeah, that is indeed an, an outstanding collaboration that's been taking place uh, all across the state. Uh, Dr. Holzman, we're gonna go back again and talk about uh, the expanded testing. And I know one of the uh, uh, goals of that was to get to more vulnerable populations. And in particular, we we're talking about Native American communities, which in Montana, that's that's really been a success story to this point, especially when you compare it to uh, some of the other parts of the country, thinking of the Navajo Nation uh, down in the Four Corners area. But if you could explain the plan about uh, working with our Native American communities and testing and what that looks like going forward. Sure, sure. So, uh, and I think a lot of the credit goes to our Native American communities for all that they have been doing uh, to keep the virus uh, suppressed and, and, and hopefully off the, uh, some of the uh, Indian country areas. But so the concept of, of this surveillance is we have a lot of things that look really positive. And we've talked about this before as far as what's happening in Montana. The number of cases has gone down considerably. Um, we, we talked about the positive 
positivity of the test. So what percentage of our tests that we're doing are coming back positive? And nationally in, in the state labs, it's about 18%. In our lab, it's been 3.5%. And in the last two weeks, it's been down to 1.4%. So now as we start to go out and do surveillance in any of these communities, and Native American community being one of them, is the question of asymptomatic. What's, what's really going out in the community and are we catching everything? So we're looking at a program working very closely with our partners in the tribes and seeing what meets their needs because they're going to help us direct this and, and what works best for them, but is to do testing, uh, randomized testing in these communities and try to find out is there other virus, is the virus out there? And of course, if we can find it, we wanna get those people isolated and the people around them quarantined as soon as possible because we wanna prevent any opportunity for an outbreak to happen there. So this is the kind of the concept that we will be doing with a lot of different populations um, to try to ascertain if there's actually disease out there that we're missing, especially asymptomatic or mild symptom disease and then getting those individuals isolated in quarantine because that's our movement as we open up the economy more. Thank you, Dr. Holzman and, and Pat. Uh, our viewers have been listening because uh, this question will be right up your alley because they, they said the economic situation seems so dismal. They wanted to know if there was any silver lining, anything good on the horizon. So here's your chance for something positive, Pat. What, what do you have for them? Well, I, 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 I could talk for 60 minutes about uh, what's good. I mean, there have been some really good decisions made. Uh, they've been made in, in, in the fog of battle, if you will, or fog of war, whatever the expression is exactly. But, uh, you know, there's been some good decisions made, some really good collaboration. It's really heartening to see the adaptability of the private sector to meet the needs that are there, whether it's distilleries making hand sanitizer, manufacturers making P, uh, protection equipment. Uh, people are, are, are all are, are doing what they can do. I think the best news though is, is really in our prediction. So we're in our shop, we're forecasters, we're looking ahead. And what we've seen of course in our recent experience and the reason why we're so laser focused on the situation is because it's been, it's been, it's been a, uh, something that's exploded, it's just mushroomed up in front of all of us, uh, both public health and the economy. I wanna say though, that there's some been somewhat artificial uh, why we've been on this ride down and the ride up could be just as fast. Uh, maybe not quite as fast, but I think when we do turn to growth and I think we're gonna turn to growth by the end of this year, we're gonna see some pretty impressive growth statistics. Uh, we're, it's like all economic data, it's gonna take some time to arrive it won't arrive every place equally, but I think the ride up could be pretty strong. Uh, the news that it's gonna be until 22 that we get back on track seems depressing, but let me tell you in the great recession, it took three times as long to get back to the growth track we had before. So this kind of event has that potential for a turnaround. It may not, not seem quick to people who are trying to meet their obligations, but by standards of economic history, it could be a very strong and robust recovery. Pat, thank you for those uh, positive words. I know our viewers very much appreciate that. And we're at the end of another program. So we're gonna have time for some final thoughts from our panelists. We always appreciate that on the way out. And uh, Dr. Holzman, we'll start with you with a, a final thought for everyone. Thank you, John. And thanks for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak with folks again. I, I guess the biggest part, I'm, I'm going to kind of continue from where I was last time and basically say, again, I think it falls on us as far as how we move forward. But I also want to say that it's, um, we don't want to put down our guard. I, I, Montana has done so well. And then you look at the national data and you look at what's going on. And so I think as long as we continue on this pass forward of how well we've been doing Montanans helping Montanans and really kind of thinking about new ways, the new normal. Um, social distancing doesn't mean social isolation. We're, we're figuring out other ways to communicate. We're learning how to do new things. I'm remembering not to shake anybody's hand when I first meet them, those type of things. As we continue to do that, if we keep the right, the right process on all that, I think we're gonna be able to move into this new normal pretty well and hopefully keep this virus at bay and uh, keep moving forward. Dr. Holzman, thank you. And uh, a final thought from Pat. 
it's it's my dream to get on TV and answer questions about the economy to a large audience. Uh, it's a shame that it took a crisis like this to uh, to make that happen. Seriously, though, I think that uh, we need to understand that the economy is not directed. The economy is come is definitely a bottom up kind of creature. So the economy does not grow because a leader points a finger and orders us to grow. The conditions for growth have to be uh, have to be there and. One of those conditions is confidence. It's confidence that when we go outside, we're not going to get sick from breathing the air. But it's also confidence that we can depend on our leadership to make good decisions, to make sensible and flexible decisions in terms of how we manage the trade-off. And it is a trade-off between uh, growing our economy and sustaining ourselves economically and fighting off the virus. So. That's something that it's very different from everything else we're doing. It's, 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 we're planting a seed in the soil and we have to let it grow. We can't tell it. Matt, thank you. Final thought and uh, final word now from Major General Quinn. You know, I, thanks John and thanks for the opportunity tonight. I would echo uh, maybe some of the previous answers of Dr. Holzman and, and Patrick and that is uh, one is a born and bred Montanan and born and raised, uh, having traveled all over uh, this this nation and, and frankly the world. Uh, I, I am so proud of what Montana has done in response to what nobody expected. We think back to November and and how life was and, and, and then come March and into April, what we had to do to respond to this crisis. And Montanans did respond. They adapted, they changed, and we lowered that curve faster than a lot of our neighbors did. And as Governor Bullock said, it put us into a position to be able to talk about a reopening and to activate a reopening plan. But I would also echo what Dr. Holzman said, and that is if it remains up to us. The actions we take today will affect how we move into a phase two or a phase three. And so I would just ask people to uh, continue with the social uh, distancing, continue with the wearing the face mask, I get a little discouraged when I go to a store or a big box or a, a hardware store and uh, people aren't wearing the mask. You know, there's a saying that the mask is not about me, it's about we. And I think we as fellow Montanans can impact on what happens as we move forward through the COVID-19 and what the new normal is gonna look like. Again, thanks for having us on. Well said, and uh, thank you, Major General Quinn. And uh, of course, thanks to the entire panel. Uh, another great job tonight. Thanks to our viewers for all those great questions. A reminder to visit our website, montanapbs.org slash COVID-19. Lots of resources available for you there as uh, we have compiled that through the weeks to uh, help us all work through this day by day, week by week, as we all work through this together. That'll wrap it up for us tonight. From all of us here at Montana PBS, thank you for joining us and good night. on American experience, inside one of the nation's most consequential presidencies. I can hear you. During two terms as president, George W. Bush would soar to the heights of popularity, then plummet to the depths of public disfavor. He wanted to be a great figure in history and to be on the side of the angels. George W. Bush.